Dr. Elaine Labrique. He got his PhD here at Johns Hopkins in the School of Public Health and Epidemiology and Infectious Disease. He is uh, an infectious disease epidemiologist by training and currently a professor and associate chair for research in the Department of International Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, with appointments in the Departments of International Health and the Department of Epidemiology, as well as the Schools of Medicine and Nursing. Uh, he is also the founding director of the Johns Hopkins Global M Health Initiative, a multidisciplinary consortium of faculty and students engaged in digital health innovation and research across the university. Uh, Dr. Labrique has served as a co-PI and PI on several large NIH funded grants and foundation funded grants from the Gates Foundation. Uh, he has done research studies exploring pathways to and prevention of adverse maternal and child health outcomes in rural South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Dr. Labrique has pioneered a number of global good digital health M health software products in conjunction with the WHO, including the Smart Register tool, Open SRP. His articles, book chapters, and re reviews of M health digital health are among the most cited in the field. And Dr. Labrique serves as a technical evaluation and policy advisor for the WHO, USA, AID, NIH, and the UN Foundation and is regularly quoted as an expert on digital health in the media and global health literature. Well, it's a great pleasure to have Elaine as part of our faculty here at Johns Hopkins. It's really a treasure that we have, uh, and we really ha love having you part of our Grand Rounds presenting to our students. Elaine, welcome. Thank you so much, Paul, and and my profuse apologies for, for subjecting you to that very, very unnecessarily long uh, bio, it, and it's, I'm very flattered, but uh, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me today, and, and it's such a pleasure to be part of uh, this amazing team, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to this year's uh, Grand Rounds conversation. Without further ado, we'll jump right in to today's uh, conversation about uh, global digital health and the, the the mantra that we've been trying to push for for many years now on uh, moving from shiny objects to national health systems strengthening so it's it's really been a, a journey to to uh, come to this point as we've uh, over over a, a 15 years ago when we started talking about digital health in as part of the global health landscape uh, some in the mainstream uh, global health world, public health world, thought of us as, as really being the, the lunatic fringe um, until I discovered uh, allies and, and friends in, in the informatics world who were also as excited about what was happening uh, in terms of the, the global digital and, and mobile revolution uh, as, as we were here on the, on the School of Public Health side. So, Really, I think I think the first thing to start with is this this mobile phone revolution, and this this animated graph that you're seeing in front of you represents uh, countries of the world where the boundaries of each country are being inflated based on the the per capita access to mobile cellular phone subscriptions, uh, where you see really the the countries of South Asia and and Sub-Saharan Africa. It just expanding rapidly in this, this short period between 2000 and, and 2016. And I think from our perspective, what was really exciting is to note that the overlap of digital health potential and the, the burden of preventable disease and mortality. In this graph, we're looking at um, neonatal and maternal deaths in, uh, in, uh, in the world. And again, countries inflated based on the proportion of mortality uh, that these countries uh, sustain. And so to us, the, this, this exciting potential overlap of a, of a major problem that we have been trying to reduce and tackle through health systems strengthening and other types of interventions, and this, this advent of uh, widespread technological connectivity really for us ref reflected a, a, an exciting point of, of uh, inflection. To me, when we talk about neonatal health, uh, it's, it's really more than just a, a statistical uh, issue to, to deal with on a, on a grand scale. 
because I was actually born in rural Bangladesh uh, many, many decades ago. Uh, but I, we, we, my mother and I nearly became one of these statistics that you, you hear about in terms of elevated maternal and neonatal mortality, born shortly after a ter terrible war of uh, independence, health systems were, were struggling to manage basic uh, services like delivery and, and neonatal care. And so from postpartum sepsis and uh, obstructed labor, we too nearly became statistics. So I take this very personally, that 40 years later, uh, 40 some years later, let's put it that way, uh, we're still fighting this fight of, of reducing maternal and neonatal mortality in these, uh, in these settings. And so Bangladesh is, is a beautiful country. And I'll start with a, with a story of, uh, of our journey in digital health in that country. Um, agrarian, riverine country, uh, beautiful, beautiful landscapes and, and amazing people. And for, for the last 25 years, Johns Hopkins has maintained a partnership in the Northwest of this country, conducting large scale population based research to understand both the pathways to neonatal and maternal mortality, um, healthy growth and nutrition, as well as uh, optimization of uh, primary health care in this setting. And so covering almost 450 square kilometers, 800 field staff have for the last 25 years studied uh, almost 150,000 pregnancy events to try and identify these, uh, these ways to reduce preventable maternal and neonatal uh, deaths. And we have been successful as a, as a global health community and as a, as a nation, Bangladesh has seen massive declines. Here's a graph showing uh, 1970 till current day, uh, showing how, you know, well compared to neighbors in the area, uh, we have seen massive declines in the rates of, of under five mortality. But even at the current low rates of, of 25 to 30 per, per thousand live births, this represents nearly 300 children dying from preventable deaths uh, each, each day. And so this is a problem that, that needs our urgent attention despite uh, the major gains that have been made over the last three decades. The real tragedy here is also that most of these deaths are preventable and, and the solution landscape is, is replete with, with solutions that we can deliver to reduce maternal and neonatal deaths, whether it's antenatal screening for risks of preeclampsia or, or eclampsia, all the way through to uh, safe and clean delivery of the newborn, to uh, respiratory therapy postnatally if uh, a child is experiencing neonatal distress. But the problem is delivering these solutions that have a known efficacy on time. We know that maternal mortality can be reduced if pregnant women receive antenatal care on a schedule that has long been recommended by WHO, and it has increased from four time points to eight time points in the recent past. But we also know that the existing community-based approaches, leveraging overworked and overwhelmed frontline health workers are not delivering the kind of results that we are hoping for. Community health workers are responsible for massive catchment areas, uh, 1,000 to 2,000 families, depending on where they're, they're working, uh, which means, you know, frankly, that, that each worker would have to to perform about 200 hours of clinical service on a daily basis in order to, to actually meet the, the, the expectations of care that they've been given. So, so this is a huge supply side challenge and, and a resource challenge in terms of um, serving large populations with limited human uh, capacity. These inefficiencies and challenges are, are compounded by the, the amount of paperwork burdens that these uh, frontline workers are required to do. Um, uh, volumes and volumes of tracking records and reporting records for all types of uh, national and international indicators that are required fall on the shoulders of these uh, frontline service providers. You can imagine the, the volume of paper that's being carried around just to 
to maintain this reporting architecture is quite uh, quite impressive. And finally, you know, supervisors are unable, based on these paper systems, to track progress off the health system at the level of uh, the community, which is to them uh, quite frustrating, uh, especially since they're the ones being held accountable to achieve some of these lofty global goals that have been set by the global health community. But it's not just a supply side problem. We also have to look at the, the demand side and the way in which families and pregnant women are disconnected from the health system in terms of uh, looking at the availability of emergency obstetric care. Here, once again, is that study area I described a few moments ago, where we see that within an area that's four times the size of Washington, D.C., no provision of emergency or basic obstetric care described here is either a yellow circle or a blue circle within the pink area that represents our study uh, site in northern Bangladesh. So a pregnant woman residing within this pink area would have to travel anywhere from one to two and a half hours to receive competent uh, obstetric care in, this, uh, in these conditions. And here are where the, uh, the facilities are, are located. So I want to start just by, by sharing with you a narrative because I think this is the most powerful way to, to travel with me to this, the setting and the context that is resonant with the kinds of challenges that we've been facing for many, many decades. Here, a young woman who's experiencing obstructed labor explains that when she tried to give birth, uh, the umbilical cord came out first. The dye or traditional birth attendant who was helping her called two others who were afraid to touch her because they had never seen anything like this and did not have the training to respond effectively. Two hours later, the family called an ambulance, but by then the baby was already dead, probably because of the asphyxia, because of the cord being wrapped around its neck. Another one here, uh, during a home delivery, a child's head becomes stuck. An untrained traditional worker used her fingers to pull the child's head to deliver the baby, and they could not re release the placenta. So the pregnant woman here continues to have so much bleeding that the family hurries to the government hospital where the attendants work to remove the placenta, stop the bleeding, but by then, uh, the, she had already hemorrhaged to such an extent that by the delays of arranging transportation, what took so long that that uh, by that time this uh, this young woman uh, died. So so it's in the midst of these tragedies that we were looking at how can we possibly circumvent these compounded delays that were leading to neonatal and maternal mortality in this context. And so in the, in the mid 2000s, one of the things that began to change quite dramatically was this telecommunications infrastructure. We began to see, uh, instead of the, the sort of bus courier services that we were using to communicate a mere 50 kilometers apart from one of our offices to another, the, the introduction of satellite dishes that were bringing internet and phone uh, telecom uh, connectivity into these rural communities where we were working. We began to see cellular networks be introduced, piggybacking on top of the fiber optic networks that had been set up to uh, enable railway communications to be more effect effective. And so you can see here between 2008 and 2010, the mobile ownership rate went from about 20% to about 45%. And at the right, you can see the proliferation of cell phone towers within this short three-year period that just occurred, uh, transforming the landscape of connectivity the same landscape in which we were observing these, uh, these potentially preventable deaths. And so we began to see these in the, in the mortality and morbidity narratives. Uh, here, a young woman who experienced obstructed labor tells that, that um, when the traditional birth attendants realized they could not handle the delivery, they phoned the family welfare assistant, a government worker, for advice. The, the, the health worker on the phone said to go to the government hospital where she was referred and, and, and received an emergency C-section. Another young woman experiencing postpartum hemorrhage 
Once again, the village doctor, who could not make it stop, used his phone to call an ambulance, mobilizing transportation to get her to a qualified tertiary care facility. And so these, this stimulated us to look at how were phones being used in these communities. And one of the things we found, even in these very early days of connectivity, when phones were just being introduced into these rural populations, that about half of the near missed events, so crises where women nearly died during pregnancy, phones were used to either call a provider or request medical advice, transportation, or financial aid. And so observing this reality in the uh, absence of any formal M health or digital health uh, intervention gave us the inspiration to try new things. We looked at could we have families notify us when women were going into labor so we could dispatch a skilled delivery team to the home to provide that careful support of that pregnant woman, uh, even if she was choosing to deliver at home or uh, being transferred to a facility. And the success of this phone-based labor notification system was tremendous. Almost 90% of the births were attended by a skilled nurse midwife team. So the silver lining for us here was to see in real life the intersection of the problem that we were trying to solve and the solution. And so for me, as a, as a, as a card-carrying Uber nerd, um, who's proud of uh, you know, my lifelong love of things like, like Star Trek, it takes me back to ask the question of how did we end up where we are today with this technology? You know, many of you may be familiar with or have heard your, your great-grandparents talk about uh, Commander Spock with the with the who Gene Roddenberry invented uh, in the 1960s and for for American TV, um, this this space age fictional narrative of people who could use technologies like the one Commander Spock is holding in his hand here to do amazing things. Right in the 1960s, this was seen as as far fetched future imagination a device that could look up information in the palm of your hand, that could record video and do diagnostic tests, um, that could communicate over long distances without the use of uh, wires. And, and to think that every single one of you, I see 54 people online, every single one of you has a tricorder probably in your pocket or sitting right there next to you on, on the table. And so this has redefined for us in, in global health, what we mean when we think about rural and remote. Uh, a few months before the lockdown of the pandemic in 2019, I was in a small village in, in rural Kenya. And as we were walking by these mud huts, I noticed that there were numbers etched into the mud walls of these huts in a place where electricity hadn't yet reached the, the village. And when I asked what these numbers were, it turns out that they were the phone numbers of the people living in this home so that they could be contacted when they, they weren't home so that people could you know, be able to ask them for goods or, or services. And so the, the reality is globally, mobile phone accessibility is almost universal. There, and, and, and it's important to think about that word, accessibility. So even if ownership is not at 100%, the, the availability of phone communications to reach out and call for help as a, as a very rudimentary example of digital health um, is, is nearly universal. There are, however, digital divides, and this is something to keep in mind, primarily by socioeconomic status and uh, gender. So I'm, I'm an epidemiologist and, and uh, uh, you know, as a scientist, we always love to, to have clear definitions. And so this is currently the, the WHO uh, um, uh, International Telecommunications Union definition of what we mean when we talk about digital health. And so it's the systematic application of ICT or information communication technologies, computer science and uh, data to support informed decision-making by individuals, the health workforce and health systems. And it's not just for health, but also wellness. 
um, as well as strengthening resilience to disease. So it's it's a it's a it's a bit of a, a a long definition, but it captures the realm of what we mean when we talk about uh, digital health. And really, I would say over the last. Uh, uh, six years or so, we've seen a real burgeoning of, of the formalization of digital health from a World Health Assembly resolution uh, declaring that, that countries should use uh, the, the considered application of digital health to solve health system problems, all the way through to official um, evidence-based digital health guidelines from the WHO, a taxonomy and, and vocabulary around standardizing how we talk about digital health, to a formal department of digital health at the World Health Organization. Um, that, so, so, so I would say we, we've come a long way from the, the, the early 2000s to, to really establishing global digital health as a, uh, a formal discipline and uh, strategy to reduce some of the persistent health inequities and challenges that we in the global health community have been trying to solve. In 2016, uh, I was privileged to be part of this process of launching the guidelines for digital health strategies, which took about four years to digest the body of evidence available for digital health finally to be launched in 2019 in the form of these formal uh, WHO guidelines. So if anyone, any one of you has had experience uh, generating or being part of the, the Cochrane reviews and other uh, evidence syntheses that go into generating guidelines, you'll know that this was, this was no easy feat that, that uh, we're, we're tremendously uh, proud of. And so the 10 um, recommendations that emerged from the uh, digital health guidelines process cover this continuum of, of life that you can see on uh, the left side of your screen, all the way from birth and death notification through digital technology, through uh, targeted client communication, some of which you, you know overlaps with strategies that we use here in the US and in other high income countries. Um, to conduct client to provider telemedicine or provider to provider telemedicine, to managing stock levels uh, and commodity management, to train frontline health workers and provide them with up-to-date uh, decision support tools, uh, all the way through to uh, continuity of care through the digital tracking of patients using portable electronic health records. And so you can see here on the right, exemplars of the types of recommendations that are evidence-based. So, so for those of us working in the health informatics or, or digital health space, this is extremely exciting because now there is actually a global recommendation that is agnostic to the, the place you live, whether it's in a high income or low income setting, that there is an evidence base that supports the, um, the use of these strategies to solve health system problems. Now, I will say we did publish another, another uh, a reflection on these guidelines that speaks to the importance. And this is where all of you who are in academia uh, play a critical role in helping us to continue to strengthen the evidence base on which this and future guidelines are based. Because one of the things that was, was very apparent as we were digesting the evidence in this space was that many of these guidelines were actually based on uh, extremely low certainty of effect because of the, the dearth of high quality research studies done to evaluate uh, these various strategies. Uh, with the exception of a few domains like um, messaging to clients, or for a client to provide their telemedicine that had much stronger and more robust, rigorous uh, evidence bases. So I think we also need to reflect when you think about why then did the WHO guidelines group come up with these uh, suggestions and recommendations for use. And even though there wasn't adequate empirical evidence of impact, I think we also looked at the other facets of uh, these interventions. We looked at the economic costs, the potential for harm, which in many cases was quite low, 
But we also considered the potential for the diversion of funding for other public health programs, such as vaccinations and preventive or curative care services that could have been disrupted by investments in the digital uh, uh, strategies that were being rec recommended. But I think there's also the perspective, and, and many of you who work in the EHR or have, have worked with, um, with uh, meaningful use types of uh, interventions in the U.S. context, there is, the, there is the argument to be made that gains in efficiency and gains in time, reductions in the paper burden, can also be clinically valuable. So freeing up clinical staff to do more care with two patients as opposed to filling out paperwork and uh, generating reports. Uh, so, so for us, the cost of inaction was, was something that, that was quite important to, uh, to think about. So in plain language, some of the, the metrics that we set up were, were really to look at uh, defining, first of all, what does the system hope to accomplish? what is suboptimal about the current state of affairs, and how can we improve the way things are using digital health uh, uh, innovations. And so, so I think you know, one of the things that I'm going to describe in the, the coming slides is how we develop tools and strategies to help strengthen implementation, to strengthen monitoring and evaluation, so that we can not only increase the evidence base around these uh, innovations, but also ensure that countries were making wise investments in problem solving through innovative technologies. So over the past decade, we've, uh, we've made quite a few advances in how we describe and define digital health. Uh, this was one of our earliest frameworks that we used to, uh, to talk about the ingredients that went into any particular uh, digital health soup, if you would. And from there, <clears throat> WHO actually built on those classifications to create this much more um, nuanced and detailed uh, four-layer classification to describe your digital health intervention. And this is really critical as you're growing a new field to make sure that when I'm talking about something or Paul or Harold is talking about something that they're doing that we're all calling digital health, being able to describe the actual features and facets of that quote unquote digital health thing is absolutely critical. And so these, these four dimensions of digital health for clients, for providers, for managers or backbone data services were, were very instrumental to helping to differentiate that landscape. And so here's basically the, the four dimensions. And, and it's not to say that a digital health solution has to be uh, locked into one of these categories, but can span one or more of these categories in terms of the functions and features that that intervention is trying to accomplish. But at the end of the day, it's really critical to keep our eye on the problem that we're trying to solve, that we don't become hammers looking for nails, but really identify first, what is the health system challenge? And so, you know, as informaticians, we love taxonomies and frameworks. And so here's another taxonomy of health system challenges that help us to first define what is the problem we're trying to solve across, across these uh, eight different uh, pillars, and then looking for solutions that address the bottlenecks that we've identified that continue to uh, decrease performance or impede optimal outcomes. So over the past two decades, uh, we in academia have contributed heavily to developing uh, frameworks, whether you're looking at ways to monitor and evaluate digital health interventions, to assess the readiness of uh, technologies for scale up or to systematically plan an information systems project. And you'll, you'll recognize some of the things I'll share with you in the coming slides as fundamental skills that, that hopefully um, for those of you who are students of informatics have picked up as the way in which uh, you know, we should be developing digital and uh, ICT based solutions. We recognize that digital health projects are complex. And so one of the tools that we developed was this uh, monitoring evaluation framework that helps to really deconstruct and identify 
um, what are the components of, of the digital health intervention that have to be uh, kept a close eye on as you're deploying and, and leveraging a, a technology for a health system solution to make sure that, for example, you're not falling asleep at the wheel and, and then assuming that the technology is doing what it's supposed to be doing and, and, and then being surprised that the outcome you were hoping for didn't happen. So a, a big example, and the one that's shown here in this, uh, in this diagram, is the program that was in, in place in Ghana, where the text messages that were supposed to be sent by the, the, the server, actually only about 30% of the time left the server and reached the target audience. And so at the end of the day, that diminished impact was perhaps not so much from the efficacy of the intervention of sending text messages, but from the failure of the technology to perform in the way that it was intended. And that could have been avoided by careful monitoring. The other problem I mentioned earlier was this um, quality and, and, um, and availability of carefully and rigorously conducted research. Uh, that, that reported on mHealth or digital health interventions. And so one other, another important tool was the development of the MIRA checklist or the mHealth Evidence Reporting and Assessment Toolkit. And so this checklist was published in the British, British Medical Journal uh, with a series of uh, points to add to the consort or PRISMA guidelines that are used by folks who are reporting these, uh, these research studies or innovations to make sure that they were usable by groups like the WHO looking to conduct evidence syntheses. But I think really exciting was this, um, this, this breakthrough event where, where at the WHO uh, in 2018, uh, a new department came to existence, which is the, the Department of Digital Health and Innovation under the chief scientist of the World Health Organization, really to be uh, in the driver's seat looking at country level recommendations and investments in this space. In 2020, this led to the launch of a global strategy on digital health that you can see here contains four strategic objectives. And it really starts to move us into this space of not building shiny objects, but investing in the foundational architectures, the, the fundamental uh, enabling ecosystem that's required for digital health to really achieve sustainable scale in these countries where we need it to be introduced and, and to grow. And so not only does this look at knowledge transfer and sharing of experiences across com communities of practice, um, helping countries to implement robustly digital health uh, interventions, but focusing also on the issues of governance, such as data privacy, data sharing, data ownership, and interoperability that were critical to the sustainability of these systems at national scale. But then lastly, I think the other, the other part of this that's increasingly recognized in the public health world, as well as uh, in the informatics and, and, and digital health space, is the fact that innovations have to be user-centered and, and human-centered uh, in their design. And that poorly designed interventions not only frustrate the end users, and, and I know each of us in the audiences has probably had conversations with, uh, with clinicians or we are, we are clinicians and, and have had experiences working with EHRs or, or, uh, or, or other uh, digital systems that seem to simply not have been designed with the end users in mind. And you can imagine the frustration that's compounded when you're a, when you're a frontline health worker using a system that's, that's poorly designed and not meant for the kinds of conditions you may be working in on the, in the villages of Liberia or rural India. So 
Another tool that I think is, is quite useful for those of you who are interested in learning more about, about global digital health is uh, this, this uh, cumulative manual, I'll call it that, that, called the Digital Implementation Investment Guide that really synthesized, and it came out just uh, last year, uh, synthesized, and you can see on the right, this, this sort of uh, soup of tools and resources that goes through a stepwise process that, that will be familiar to many of you trained in informatics, where it talks about a systematic approach of assessing the current enabling environment, defining the current state of how a particular workflow or business process um, is operating in a health system, defining from that current workflow or current state a future state, and then planning not only the enterprise architecture, but the functional and non-functional requirements necessary to build an effective digital health intervention. So, so this is really a fantastic resource for folks who want to delve deeply into the, uh, the mechanics of developing digital health uh, solutions in the, the global scale. And so here's a, 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 just a snapshot of the, uh, the table of contents where you can see and hopefully resonate with uh, a lot of the, the steps that have been defined in uh, designing and launching a digital health uh, strategy. So in, in addition to, um, uh, to, to the careful design of the system, we're also looking at uh, how to develop workflows. And this is something that uh, you know, informaticians have heavily influenced the, the um, introduction of this type, type of deconstruction of health system uh, workflows by, by actors using these uh, swim lane diagrams. And then sort of a systemic mapping of current state and future state of uh, health systems to really hone in on not just what the solution needs to be at the, the point of use or point of care, but, but the enabling environment in terms of the ecosystem of technologies and interoperability layers that have to exist in order for these systems to work at their optimal performance. <clears throat> to assist in the development of user-centered innovation, the, the guide also focuses on the development of personas and, and the process that, that is necessary for the, um, the user-centeredness of uh, the development and deployment of, uh, of these technologies. And so hopefully, you know, these uh, tools and these, uh, these terms are things that, that resonate deeply with those of you who, are, um, who have been working in uh, software development or in uh, the, the health informatics program here at, uh, at the school. And so all of this comes together at the end of this uh, implementation guide in what we call a costed investment plan that allows ministries of health or large implementing NGOs to actually come out not just with a rigorous, uh, well-defined strategy that takes into account scalability and sustainability through the enabling ecosystem, but also develops a budget and a value proposition for folks that, that hold the purse strings in many of these contexts. So ministries of finance or funding agencies that, that need to get behind uh, these investments. And so, you know, we're talking about the importance of not just the, the widget or the, the technological solution that has to be developed, but we have to pay attention to the policy environment. We have to pay attention to the institutional engagement because that's where the human resources that will run these systems are coming from. And of course, the financial cost, not just the one-time initial cost to procure the technologies out, to, out the gate, but the cost of replacing those technologies in a three to five year time frame when those technologies begin to fail or become obsolete. There have been over the past several years, the emergence of communities of practice. And so I would encourage those of you who are interested to tap into these uh, networks of practitioners and of uh, thought leaders who are looking at the, the constantly shifting sands of, uh, of digital health across the globe. Um, there are tools such as the Global Digital Health Index 
that uh, has been launched to look at country level readiness across a number of axes for digital health investments. Um, this, uh, this resource has been used to look at a number of different trends, including the, the dearth of public funding for digital health, which is currently, despite the enthusiasm for this space, uh, the funding levels remain abysmally uh, low. But also, I think the need for thought leadership in uh, governance and policy structures that will ensure the safe and effective uh, scale up of these types of interventions. There are also uh, atlases and atlases or compendia of innovations. And, and I, I like to call this a strategy to prevent wheel reinvention. So, so the atlas that we actually helped WHO launch this a number of years ago, helps to catalog what are the digital health interventions that are being used to address those problems that I, I uh, alluded to earlier in the problem taxonomy in order for countries, rather than reinventing something anew, for countries to learn from their neighbors or from other parts of the globe to identify solutions that could be repurposed or perhaps tweaked for uh, that particular geographic context. For folks interested in, uh, in more health systems based uh, thinking about digital health, uh, a couple of years ago, we published this, uh, this thorough review, and this is available at uh, the Global Health and Science and Practice Journal. Um, and, and I'll be happy to share the link with anyone who's, who's interested in reading further about this area. Here at Hopkins, uh, there are a number of different teams working in the global digital health space, one of which uh, is led by Dr. Dustin Gibson, who is the PI of the global um, Bloomberg Data for Health initiative that have been conducting a number of micro randomized control trials to optimize the delivery of mobile phone surveys as a way of rapidly assessing the health of a population. Um, and so there's, there's a, a phenomenal amount of work going on uh, in this domain. And there are others at the school here working with WHO to develop a smart guidelines, which is really a revolution in how WHO um, develops recommendations for country implementation. And so moving from the current state of paper-based or digital uh, lists of uh, services and decision trees that should be followed, moving towards machine readable guidelines that can be up, up taken, up took by, by any system that is uh, standardized, that, that uses a, a, a standard uh, a system like a HL7 Fire that can read these uh, specifications and and integrate these latest recommendations based on a synthesis of, uh, of the evidence, all the way through to models that are dynamic, where we're looking at precision health models that are trained and optimized to achieve uh, outcomes in that context where these guidelines are being uh, deployed. You can see here an example of how these business processes have been defined for antenatal care and uh, in, in, in support of these SMART guidelines. And these include not just the workflows, but the, uh, the business rules that, that are in the background of how these different, uh, these different contact points are scheduled based on gestational age or the identification of pregnancy. There are data dictionaries that are being developed to help uh, govern this space and uh, and you can, you know, for those of you who are informaticians in the room, this is uh, very familiar territory for, uh, for all of you. Um, and of course, the, what's also being developed as part of this, these initiatives are reference apps or interoperable applications that can be used as a starting point for countries to, to take and, and modify to meet the needs of their, uh, their specific um, circumstances. So as we move forward, we are also exploring some of the new frontiers of technology, such as AI and machine learning, the WHO, USAID, and, and other major uh, 
investment partners are looking at uh, developing guidelines for the ethical and responsible use of AI and machine learning to optimize health outcomes using digital systems. And you can see here a whole range of different AI use cases for global health illustrated uh, in the diagram on your right. We're also thinking about digital technology as a way to finally realize this thing we've been talking about for many, many decades, and that is person-centered care. Um, going back to the declaration of Alma Atta in the 1970s, and now the, the reaffirmation of the importance of this in the Astana Declaration in 2018, the fact that putting people in control of their own health and pu putting people in the center means that they people have to be have to have access to information and uh, and and services that help them ma maintain this their state of health, but also reach care as they should need it. And this is no easy transformation because it really means redefining the way we deliver care in most of the world, including here in the sophisticated environments of uh, Europe and, and North America. Um, it means giving people the ability to uh, request care on their own terms at times that are convenient to them, something that we've seen over the last two years during the COVID pandemic with the skyrocketing of telemedicine solutions that have emerged because of the, the physical restrictions to mobility that were imposed uh, during the pandemic. We're also looking at ways to use technologies to attack the next frontier that is currently uh, the, the tsunami of non-communicable diseases that are responsible for most of the, the preventable deaths that are not just in high income countries, but around the globe. And so could mobile technologies and digital health interventions be used to address things like um, behavioral incentives or physical activity tracking and food choice facilitation? Once we thought of these as, as interventions that were limited to high income uh, environments, but we're rapidly seeing that these are applicable also to uh, low resource settings as technology becomes more and more sophisticated. I think uh, a few of the last notes that I want to leave you with is really the importance of us moving uh, from focusing on the shiny objects or the interventions themselves to really building the architecture for uh, uh, national scale ecosystems that, that will enable digital health interventions to flourish. And on the left, you have a map of early 2000s Uganda, where you can see this proliferation of digital health technologies. Each of the little labels represents a, a digital health pilot. Uh, so much so that this was called this this inflamed picture you see to the left is is a pilotitis of of technologies that were disconnected from each other that were not speaking to one another that were not coordinated by any central government agency or or a collaborative body moving from that scenario to a scenario where countries are investing in um, health information exchanges with interoperability layers and shared services, client registries, facility registries, health worker registries that can allow for common data elements to be shared across external point of care systems. That, that's really an, uh, uh, a change in the level of maturity that uh, we've seen in this field. We're seeing investment in these, these uh, interoperability backbones, as well as in um, global goods. So whether these are the Lego building blocks that can be cobbled together to build solutions, uh, messaging uh, systems or uh, electronic health record backbones that, that don't need to be reinvented every single time you're trying to create a digital solution, and a group called Digital Square is, uh, is funded to develop these, uh, these global goods. And so at present, there are, there are 27 global goods and rapidly counting uh, higher uh, available for access in the global community. 
And so I, I recommend those of you who are interested to dig deeper into learning about Digital Square. Now the pandemic, if it's if it has a silver lining, which uh, you know, which is hard to to really think about, given the the tremendous tragedy of the loss of life um, around the world, and and you know today's announcement that over a million Americans have have lost their lives due to COVID nineteen. Um, the only possible silver lining that I've seen come out of, of, of this tragedy is the fact that countries are recognizing that this new connected reality that, that predated the pandemic is one that we absolutely have to leverage to strengthen our resilience to future health system shocks. And so countries have to be able to leverage digital infrastructure as a way of improving surveillance as a way of improving responsiveness to uh, future pandemics. We looked at uh, the landscape of digital solutions here through the M Health Initiative, and this report is, uh, is available uh, on our website and online, um, assessing across these, uh, these 12 dimensions, uh, the, the most commonly used uh, digital solutions for COVID-19 response on a global uh, landscape. And you can see here examples of how, how detailed that uh, analysis uh, goes to. So lastly, I'll say, uh, you know, there's a lot of new innovation on the landscape. Uh, the, the, the definitions we use in digital health are constantly evolving. For those of you not familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, uh, it's, a, it's a commercial sector group that looks at the, uh, the range of technologies and it tries to look at, you know, what is really in uh, productive use versus in, uh, in uh, the peak of inflated expectations on this uh, hype cycle. And so gradually, I think more and more of the things that are um, shiny objects will make their way into mainstream use. And hopefully the ones that, that aren't uh, capable of surviving at scale will languish in this trough of disillusionment that you see here in the, uh, in the middle of the graph. So with that, uh, I really want to thank you guys and, and you know, keep in mind that sometimes the most effective digital health strategy is the phone used as a phone. Um, just the, the power of making a simple connection between a provider and a patient um, by voice can sometimes be transformative in, in the quality of care and uh, outcomes. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today, and I look forward to uh, uh, some questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I loved it. I uh, and it's. I'm going to have to update my uh, my um, my my. I always say that you know the technology is a third of the solution, and now I've got to say it's a quarter of the solution. There's four pieces to the puzzle that you have to address from the users to the organization, to understanding the financial sustainability of the solution as well. So I, I appreciate. Uh, that uh, that update in my estimate of that. One of the things uh, I was interested in is is I, I really appreciate you addressing pilotitis. Is how do we learn from pilots is really hard, and providing that systems based effort is what we need to do. We have now millions of digital health solutions uh, on you know in the Apple Store and the Google Store. And, uh, and being able to try to figure out what are some of the pieces around that. I did was hoping you could address, um, I, I, where, where do you see the role of open source? Do you see this, as a, do you see this uh, playing an important part in, in yeah. the developing countries for solutions that are sustainable and uh, over a period of time? It's a really great question, Paul, and one that, that's, I think, not without some controversy. Um, but I would say, by and large, the one of the founding principles that so there, there are actually nine principles of digital development that were embraced by the global digital health community uh, almost a decade ago, and and one of the pillars of these of these uh, these principles is to to uh, to build open source technologies that can that can be uh, leveraged and expanded. Uh, based on the need and the, the the use cases, so so that that extensibility of software, but also I think it's it's not just um, uncurated open source. It's it's carefully mentored and curated open source communities like OpenMRS 
or open LMIS, open SRP there. If, if you go to the digital uh, square link, um, you will see sort of this collective of, of robust open source systems that have come with a level of curation, careful curation that enables them to be the type of enterprise grade solution uh, that is needed for the, the level of deployment uh, that we're talking about. So, so it's not sort of the, the GitHub, uh, you know, experimental open source that everyone's piling onto and, and creating these, these monsters of, of, uh, of sort of un, unregulated uh, systems, but, but it's carefully curated and um, managed open source that, that is what they're talking about. And, and so it really is a, a, an opportunity for us to build resilient systems that are extensible and that, that draw on the needs, the, the growing and changing needs of these communities that they're serving. But it's, it's been fantastic to watch how um, countries from you know, Kenya to Bangladesh are cross-pollinating with each other as developers, you know, really work to build on each other's strengths and, and innovations, as opposed to, to expanding energy and resources on reinventing the wheel and really slowing down uh, the rate of progress. Um, so so it's, it's, it's a contentious issue because there are a lot of private sector companies that, that initially sort of fought back and thought, well, you know, uh, where's the business model in open source? And, and I think uh, they've come around now to recognizing that, that just because something is open source does not mean that it's, it's technically simple. And so there's still a business model for these, uh, these innovators to play a very strong role in, in customizing and curating and managing even an open source technology. That's great. The other question I had was, you know, open source is really very helpful in doing reference implementations of new standards. You mentioned in here that there's a, some lack of digital standards, and that's an area that, you know, that's, that, that uh, a lot of us can get involved in. So I was hoping you could expound upon what type of standards you see are missing that we can, you know, uh, put some energy into that can help this ecosystem uh, thrive. You know, terminology services was was one area that that really was was lacking when it came to um, public health use cases or or preventive care services. Uh, there are initiatives that um, that that have been launched by the global global health community to develop um, open open source terminologies for. Um, for public health use cases, so so that that there can be standardization and interoperability across these these sort of public health focused, not clinically focused uh, um, uh, systems. Uh, I think the other the other domain is is really, and I think one of the revolutionary uh, 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 standards has been the HL7 fire. That has has really been transformative, not not only in high income settings, but is now serving as a backbone standard for a lot of system development in in the LMIC context as well. So, um, you know, further work on on uh, on optimizing and expanding use cases, leveraging uh, some of those standards is is absolutely critical. But I think I think. Uh, the other, the other, I'll put it in the in the chat here. Um, looking at the Open HIE community, and uh, and learning from some of the 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 uh, successes and failures of of that uh, ecosystem would be would be really, I think, exciting for for students uh, and informatics uh, folks in 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 their audience, um, because I think there's a lot of uh, support that they could receive from from experts like yourselves. And we have a question from the audience member about the UK NIH initial strides in digital health. I don't know if you're familiar with that program uh, or some of the challenges that it encountered. It's a complex problem set, but but I think I you know I had a chance to work with the Darcy Commission, who was looking at some improving and strengthening some of these uh, some of the digital health investments. And I think they they've come a long way. They've come a long way from. In, in terms of recognizing the importance of human-centered design and, and invested heavily in 
co-creation of innovations. Um, uh, several of the, uh, the hospitals involved at the, at the core of developing some of these innovations have created um, centrally, physically centrally located innovation hubs within clinical environments. So like, like the Technology Innovation Center, um, really serving as a, as a focal point for clinicians and administrators to engage with solution developers and to, to, to present problem sets and to co-create the, the solutions that can leverage some of these health information systems to, to come up with those, those solutions. And so, so I think that co-creation, that, that spirit of design thinking that, that I know, Paul, you and uh, your colleagues embrace uh, quite, quite heavily um, is helping to turn that story around. Um, but I also think, uh, you know, in addition to that, uh, movement towards um, uh, defining care pathways has also been really, really useful for uh, NHS. So, so now the, the sort of care pathways uh, experience has led to uh, a lot of very successful, even, even private sector initiatives. And one of them, um, you know, HUMA, founded by a Hopkins uh, alum, uh, actually has been has been intrinsically linked with uh, a lot of NHS innovation that I, I recommend folks. I put the link in the chat that you guys can go in and, and look at the kind of thing that they've uh, they've developed and with great success. There are so many ways to fail that you and I know how pilots can fail in so many ways. It's one of the reasons you've helped develop those frameworks to understand what problem you're trying to solve, to try, try to understand, to look at it like a system, to try to understand all the stakeholders engaged in it and try to understand how uh, they're going to, and how it integrates into a, you know, into a workflow system. So uh, I think that's really what your frameworks are trying, the frameworks that are being developed, help us look at the problem so that we can, as we're going into this, we can better understand it, but then being able to have that with the, that empathy of understanding the end users and how they're going to engage with the technology. Uh, is always a key part of informatics. Paul, if I might just give one very simple metaphor, and that is, uh, you know, in addition to the, the the intrinsic factors, right, that that make a technology uh, scalable or resilient to to uh, to scale, um, and that that's really the design and the integrity of the of the solution itself. The solution to me is like a seed that you're planting in soil that is either fertile or not fertile. And that, that soil, the fertility of the soil refers to the enabling ecosystem in which innovation is, is planted, right? Is there, <clears throat> are there the structures in that soil that, that, that will enable, um, enable growth? And those, those, Elements of, of, of fertility, right? Uh, uh, the 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 what is it? The the miracle grow ingredients are things like governance and uh, legal infrastructures and interoperability architectures and uh, you know clear published and and universally accepted standards within that that ecosystem, right? So that you can understand as a developer what are the build to criteria that you're 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 uh, building into your APIs and so forth and so so if that fertility isn't there the seed will not flourish and i think that's yeah. that's something that that we've neglected for a long time because we've we've thought that's 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 outside of my concern as a as an innovator i have to focus on the the innovation and the ecosystem someone else will take care of but in fact yeah. no if nobody's watering the seeds and and adding that miracle grow um you know you you can't look forward to a healthy tomato crop i couldn't agree more and and in addition to the ecosystem it's really about the change practitioner who's going to be able to take that technology and adapt it locally be able to really influence behavior you know i, I really still feel it's a leadership act and so we need mm -hmm. to have as part of this there needs to be leadership training uh for people who are trying to re-engineer these these healthcare delivery systems and so uh, I know that's a big part of, of the study is understanding how do we build that capacity for people to, to deploy technology and understand how to re-engineer a process in a, in a local environment. But uh, we, so thank you so much for your time. This was a 
really a great discussion. It's always great to see you. It is a, a phenomenally fertile time to see your, the, the evolution of technology and just the phone. You know, your network has been deployed. You're, you're, you know, in terms of uh, you now have a great infrastructure for as a uh, research instrument for being able to see things that are going to be you know, in these developing countries. So um, it is, uh, it's an incredible time to, to see this type of work flourish. Uh, yeah, fantastic. And thank you so much for, for inviting me. There's one last question in the chat. Let me just answer that. Um, yeah. Our Mayank my, my Agarwal, uh, you, you should look into the Aishman Bharat digital mission and the national digital health uh, blueprint of, uh, of the government of India. And, and your questions hopefully will be answered um, by, by, by those uh, websites um, and, and sort of the, the template that, that uh, the government has, has re released for, for that. So fantastic, you're on the road to ABDM compliance. So, so you know that well. Perfect. Alrighty. All right, thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Harold, thanks, Paul, and, and have the, a wonderful weekend everyone.